So welcome to lesson four, food as fuel, the final lesson for the day. I will try to get this done as painlessly as possible. I recognize it has been a busy day, but unfortunately we just have a sheer metric ton of volume to cover. So let's take a look at food as fuel from a perspective of macromolecules as a whole and why they're so important. So when we think about food and when we think about the specific foods that we consume, it's very important to think about carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, all of those things that we consume in terms of that it's going to be broken down to release energy. So when the bonds are broken between those atoms of those molecules, energy can be released and that energy uh, can be reutilized. Remember that bond energy calculations chart from the two units ago or two lessons ago, sorry, where we looked at all the different bonds and how much energy is stored within those bonds that energy can be released and utilized by cells in some way, shape, or form. So the, the cool thing about this is, is that fats contain more energy than carbs and proteins, uh, nine calories per gram compared to four calories per gram. And the reason being is that fats contain much more energy per gram in that carbon and hydrogen bonds in their fatty acid tails. Those carbon hydrogen bonds are nonpolar, so there's a ton of energy stored within that hydrocarbon chain, and they tend to be quite long in most cases, depending on the type of fat. So there is more energy stored in fats per se. We'll talk more about it, why fats aren't the preferred energy source as we move through it. But just keep that in mind that fats are going to be more energy rich than carbs and proteins per gram. So what are those energy in bonds or bond energies? Why are they so important? Because it's really important that we recognize how to connect that idea of energy in those bonds, that bond energy to how we can utilize it to create energy within the cell because it's not just a one-to-one -one connection. Recall from last lesson, we use something called ATP. So when bonds between hydrogen and carbon break, those atoms uh, and their atoms form bonds with different atoms, a lot of energy is released, right? That electronegativity difference between carbon and hydrogen is quite low. So when their bonds break, these atoms tend to form bonds with more electronegative atoms. And those electronegative atoms are going to be, in this case, oxygen. Oxygen is a fantastic electron receiver, okay? It loves to receive electrons, really, really good at it, really good at storing those electrons. And that's one of the underpinning reasons why we respire oxygen in and exhale carbon dioxide out. It has a lot to do with the fact that oxygen is a very good electron acceptor. So there is going to always be a fairly equal share of electrons between those carbon, carbon and hydrogen bonds, again, because it's nonpolar. Again, really tying back into everything from unit one in those first couple of lessons. That equal energy shareage are, is going to allow for oxygen to kind of, once it steps in and takes on that electron, they're going to draw closer to that nucleus of other atoms like oxygen, which then releases energy. Okay, So there's going to be a lot of processes that go on that allow for oxygen to not only take on that electron, but to release energy as a result of taking that electron on. As electrons move further from the positive nucleus, energy needs to be absorbed. So this again, that key component here, whenever that electron draws closer into the nucleus of other atoms like oxygen, because it's coming from something where it's pretty evenly distributed in that nonpolar bond of carbon and hydrogen, that releases energy when that electron goes to oxygen and it gets real close to that nucleus. So this redox reaction is, is, is one of the main things that we're going to talk about in the context of that electron donor and electron receiver. Because again, when we call back to that knowledge that we gained in our first unit, we really have to think about that transfer of electrons or hydrogen between reactant particles. That redox reaction must, must happen together. And, and it's for this reason that we're, we're really going to focus on the idea that it needs to happen together. Something needs to lose electrons in order for something to gain electrons because that energy can be transferred, but it can never be created or destroyed. So recall oxidation, the atom or molecule or the reactant will lose electrons. Leo is a loss of electrons. Oxidation. Reduction is that gain of electrons. That reactant or that atom molecule is going to gain electrons. So the oxidizing agent 
the atom or molecule that gains electrons, as I alluded to earlier in that part of the in this part of the lesson, that's going to be our oxygen molecule. It's really good at receiving oxygen. And in this example off to the right here, we're talking about what's going to be gaining electrons, oxygen. What's going to be reducing or donating electrons? It's going to be that CH4, that hydrocarbon. So when we think about the importance of this reaction, I'll zoom in here just a little bit to make it life easily. Uh, we have to recall those hydrocarbons, that carbon and hydrogen bond, it's going to be pretty equally shared, right? That nonpolar aspect, the electrons are equally shared. Same thing goes for oxygen, that nonpolar react, that nonpolar atom or molecules. When electrons are equally shared, the energy distribution is quite nice. However, when we look at that redox reaction happening, where oxygen takes on electrons, those products are going to release energy as a result of electrons moving closer to the oxygen nucleus. It creates that unequal sharing of electrons. It creates a polar molecule, in this case carbon dioxide and water, and that polarity allows for the release of energy. So carbon has lost its electrons, and it's lost that hold on electrons, so therefore it's seen as oxidized. Oxygen has gained electrons, it's gained electrons, and is therefore seen as reduced. And because oxygen is gaining electrons and pulling it closer towards its nucleus, it's changing energy levels, and as a result of that energy level change, it is releasing energy out. So here we can start to see where that simple simple redox reaction that we looked at in lesson oh i want to say two or three from unit one we can now start to tie it into the idea of oh okay that free energy can be released from that sorry not free energy that uh exothermic energy can be released as a result of that and due to that energy being released it can be harnessed this is like pretty this is a very crucial section, so I'll just mark that for folks to, to kind of review later because I, I will ask several questions on this, uh, not just on this quiz, but in quizzes in the future as well. So when we think about redox reactions, instead of drawing the entire structural diagram like I did in that previous diagram uh, to determine where uh, a reactant goes, whether it's oxidized, reduced, what have you, uh, we can also follow these rules. Oxidation will always be a removal of hydrogen or an addition of oxygen atoms. Reduction will always be a removal of oxygen or an addition of hydrogen. So it's a, a pretty, my hope is that it's a pretty easy and straightforward way to shorthand look at a chemical reaction specific to metabolic processes and look at it and say, okay, I can determine what's being oxidized and what's being reduced based on what is being removed or added. So let's take a look at it in the context of this first example. We have C6H12O6. That's going to be added to our six oxygen molecules. A chemical reaction is forming. As a result of that, we have carbon dioxide and we have H2O. So we need to think about, okay, what's gaining and what's losing hydrogen and oxygen. So my first one I have in blue, that carbon is going to be added to that oxygen molecule. Okay, it's gonna be added to that oxygen molecule. So we're looking at in terms of, we're looking at it in terms of oxidation. Okay, oxidation, that carbon molecule, that carbon molecule is gaining an oxygen, it's gaining oxygen. Likewise, likewise, with regards to the reduction component, we have that oxygen that's gaining, that's gaining hydrogen, all right? So the oxidizing agent in this chemical equation is oxygen, and the reducing agent is going to be that sugar or glucose. It's, it's kind of tricky at this point to really get the terminology down because you really have to realize what is actually oxidizing what when it's going through that oxidation process the oxidizing agent is used to reduce the reducing agent is going to uh, be responsible for oxidation that's why i've kind of color-coded it here to kind of help you recognize what connects to what 
oxidation, that oxidation process, it needs that reducing agent to go through. The reduction process needs that oxidizing agent. Um, so when we think about why is it that opposite oxidation and oxid, uh, yeah, so the opposites you need in order for a reduction to happen, you have to have an oxidizing agent. And in order for an oxidation to happen, you have to have a reducing agent. It's just to do with the fact that one will be the electron donor and one will be the electron receiver. Okay. So let's take a look at this next example to hopefully kind of uh, solidify this understanding a little bit as we move through. We're going to have to try to determine which of these is oxidized and which of these is reduced. Okay. So again, the key thing you have to realize here is if that iron is losing if that iron is losing oxygen, okay, if that iron is losing oxygen, it's going to be seen as a reduction, okay? If it's losing oxygen, it's going to be seen as a reduction. This carbon here is gaining oxygen, it's gaining an oxygen, therefore we say it to be an oxidation. Now, the tricky part here, what is the oxidizing agent? What is the reducing agent? It's always going to be flipped. Okay, it's always going to be flipped. So our oxidizing agent here is that iron oxide, right? And then that reducing agent here is going to be our carbon. So these two examples are really, are really important for our understandings in terms of what will behave as the reducing agent in an oxidation reaction and what will behave as the oxidizing agent in a reduction, which then all comes together to form that lovely reaction we call a redox reaction. So now we're going to look at some speed components and rapid versus controlled oxidation. As the name suggests, when we look at rapid oxidation, it's going to result in the production of CO2, H2O, and large amounts of energy. That quick burning of gasoline and any type of combustion it's producing huge, huge, huge quantities of thermal energy. Since H2O and CO2 are already oxidized, they don't contain any more available energy. So there's no more energy in there. They can't give or receive any more uh, electrons. So therefore, they can't create that energy, right? So there's no more available energy in those bonds. They're essentially waste byproducts. This is quite interesting because when you think about water, it's quite important for life as a whole, uh, but in reality, when we think about it in terms of cellular processes, it's effectively a waste product. So it's interesting to see those parallels between water, which is so important to life in general, uh, and in metabolic processes, it's actually a waste product. So looking at glucose is a really good way to, to think about hydrocarbons that can undergo rapid oxidation if it is burned. Uh, but a lot of that energy would be released and completely useless as thermal energy. And we really don't need thermal energy to synthesize ATP. Thermal energy burns too hot, it's too unwieldy, and it can't be properly harnessed to create the energy that we need in cellular production or cellular processes. So we have to be able to collect the energy produced from these reactions and use it uh, and so the rapid oxidation is no good to us. That rapid oxidation is no good to us. Instead, glucose needs to go through a series of enzyme catalyzed or catalyzed reactions called controlled oxidation. And this is like a great, you'll start to see I ask a lot of similar questions in terms of compare and contrast. Controlled oxidation versus rapid oxidation. That controlled oxidation is so, 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 so important for ATP synthesis. So when we look at the individual steps of ATP synthesis, so to speak, and the breakdown of sugar in a controlled oxidation reaction, it's quite important to realize that a small energy is released when these bonds break. Realistically, it, it, it seems like a lot, but over a period of time, that individual bond breaking is, is quite small. But that energy released can be transferred. It can be transferred to carrier molecules, which provide energy to power another reaction. So while it might be individually small, over a large quantity and a large amount within the cell, it can be used to power other reactions. 
this is where we start to, to get into some of those carrier molecules. Uh, NAD and FAD are ca electron carrier molecules. I'll talk more about it tomorrow when I look at the synthesis of ATP and when we start to look at uh, the real metabolic processes in fine detail, uh, because we do cover it quite quite extensively in this class in terms of the production of ATP. So we'll look at NAD and FAD as those electron carriers uh, as we move forward through this class. So in each of these graphs here on the left side, I have an idea that the after the activation energy is added, the reaction happens rapidly, producing lots of heat. This is that rapid combustion. No good for us, right? You can't really use this steady production, this steady or this fast drop in uh, in energy, that large activation energy overcome by thermal energy, uh, and ultimately that free energy is released as thermal energy and is pretty useless, okay, for all intents and purposes. It really just contributes to that entropic uh, aspects of the universe. However, with regards to controlled oxidation, there are many enzyme catalyzed reactions, many, many, many tiny steps that allow for the transfer of energy from that source, that carbon, that electron donor, it allows it many, many opportunities to give electrons to those electron carriers, which will allow for the storage and the energy use of cells later. And it, it's, it seems like a lot of steps. And honestly, when we look at that metabolic process of the mitochondria, it, it is quite step extensive. But the reason why it's so step extensive is because so many different enzyme catalyzed reactions take place to make proper use of those uh, of that potential energy. So these energy carrier molecules, they are spectacular for lack of a better word. Uh, these are one of the most essential oxidizing or oxidation reactions in eukaryotic cells um, because that oxidation of glucose and cellular respiration is so crucial to this entire operation. Throughout cellular respiration, something called dehydrogenase, it's an enzyme that removes hydrogen atoms from substrates and transfers their high energy electrons to carrier molecules. That This is like the be all and end all when it comes to this class, specifically this unit, because this dehydrogenase, as you can tell by its name, it removes hydrogen from its substrate, in this case sugar, and transfers that high energy electron to those carriers. And again, those carriers are gonna be NAD or FAD. And we'll talk more about that, what they are as we move forward. But this NAD, right? Or nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide or NAD for short, because it's a bit of a mouthful to say every time. It's the most common carrier of energy uh, in, and uh, for any molecule in a cell. So NAD is gonna be the most abundant electron carrier within cells. The oxidized form of NAD is NAD+, plus, and it can gain two electrons. So this is quite important that NAD can gain two electrons. While the reduced form, NADH, can, oh, can lose two electrons. We will see another energy carrier uh, molecule called FAD later. But the biggest one for us is that NAD molecule, that nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide, because it's so common in all cells of all walks of life, every walk of life, uh, that it's something that we can utilize quite often. So the energy carried by NADH facilitates that transfer of electrons needed for that ATP synthesis, okay? So, oops. So the key thing about all of these steps it's all in an attempt to make that ATP. In order to make that ATP, we need electrons. In order to do that, we need something that can carry electrons and hold electrons and then give them off later. So very little energy is wasted by the transfer of these electrons using this carrier. So it not only does it accept electrons and give them very well, but it doesn't waste any of the energy. So you can start to see now why that slower, um, that slower combustion or oxidation, that controlled oxidation is way, 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 way better than that rapid combustion because very little, if none at all, energy is lost in that electron transfer between that electron donor, that sugar, and that NAD, that electron acceptor. So let's take a look at some of the specifics of that NAD reaction. And then we can take a look at some redox reaction practice, and then that will be it for the day in terms of lessons. 
So let's take a look at what happens when we describe that NADH reaction. So again, that very little energy is lost. And we can start to now think about it in terms of what happens when, oops, what happens when that NADH takes on an electron? Okay, so here we have that positively charged N plus attract a negatively charged electron. This is on the left-hand side here, okay? This is the most important part of the redox reaction and that electron exception of that NADH, that positive N ion, that positive nitrogen ion, it's really, really good at accepting electrons, okay? So two electrons and one hydrogen ion have been removed from that substrate by dehydrogenase enzymes. That's that uh, freeing of electrons as a result of that enzyme that takes away that hydrogen, takes away those electrons through an, a catalyzed reaction, and it can connect it to NADH. So oxidized NAD plus, on the left side, and then reduced NADH. The NADH form has already taken on that electron. It's already added on that hydrogen ion as well as another electron. And now we have this reduced electron acceptor, which can now be used in later processes to form ATP. I get it folks, it's a lot of information and it is quite detail oriented. This is the nature of, of some of the mechanics that we're going to be studying in grade 12 biology. So I'm going to give you the rest of the afternoon to kind of just digest it a little bit. I'm going to post the quiz at 3 o'clock, and I will give you that opportunity now to ask some questions and see clarification.